Welcome to Party Politics, where we prepare you for your next political conversation. I'm Jeronimo Cortina, political science professor at the University of Houston. And I'm Brandon Roddinghouse, a political science professor also here at the University of Houston. Thanks for taking a break from Taylor Swift and or football to talk some politics with us. <laughs> I know it's been a lot lately. Which and will is be a now lot. convoluted now. Football, <laughs> politics, Taylor Swift. You know what? It's all part of the same yep. package, yep. and we're here to deliver, right? All right. Um, there's a lot going on this week, so we should get into it. And I want to ask you, the number one Swifty in this country, about yes. what's happening in Washington D.C., especially about the border bill. We've previewed this a couple of for a couple of weeks. Now it's basically busted. What is the sort of source of the complication in D.C., and why is it that we can't get some progress on immigration reform? Well, it's President Trump. Yeah. Um, basically, he stopped a deal. Yeah. So if you remember correctly, a few years, I mean, a few weeks ago. <laughs> so I don't remember like few, years. A year's no, right. weeks maybe. <laughs> yeah, a few weeks ago, we discussed this, right? Yeah. And what we said here was like, you know, Democrats should take advantage, should say, we'll give you whatever you want, yeah. and then kill down kill everything that has to do with immigration and the election. Obviously, that's not in the Republicans' advantage. Right. And the Republicans are just doing that. They're just trying to play it. Yeah. Why? Because if you call them out, yeah. in terms of giving them what they want, uh, in, in this case, uh, closing the border, yeah. and basically this deal will close the border, yeah. the president would have the authority to close it, and President Biden said... If we pass this thing right now, yeah, the the moment I sign the bill, I will close the border. Yeah. It's a Title Forty Two mm. uh, with a different name. Yes, yes. So that's what's going on. Yeah, and it's honestly kind of doomed from the start, right? You didn't have anything that the business community wanted. You didn't have anything that the left wanted. So ultimately, it's this sort of security-focused bill that really wasn't appealing or appeasing to anybody. So as you said, too, the politics of an election year all backed into this, and it's impossible to get things done. And then, of course, Donald Trump comes in with the final death blow on yep. it and said, you know, this is something that I will work hard to make sure it doesn't pass. And honestly, not every case, but in many cases, Cases, when he comes out against something, it definitely doesn't go anywhere. The other thing to consider is this. It's hard to get stuff passed in D.C. nowadays, right? And so that is always true, but especially true when it comes to immigration reform in an election year yep. with Donald Trump and Joe Biden at the kind of polls. So yep. there's no way to make this go in any significant way. So I think at that point, it's pretty much dead. The Senate's still trying to work some kind of a deal, which I think is risky for them, because if the Senate Republicans pass something and ultimately it gets through that body and then goes to the House and the House says, no, we can't, right? Basically, you've got Johnson as the executioner on this and right. Trump is sort of, you know, twisting his mustache like, you know, right. let's kill this thing dead. It could backfire on Republicans because then it looks like the parties were trying to work something out, but Republicans in the House said no. And if you want to run on that, you know, Democrats would say, then you need to do something about it. But that hasn't happened. Yeah, I mean, I can see that. Yeah. But also, you know, remember that I understand that the yeah. Republican Party is owned by President Trump, right. like yeah. 100%. Yeah. The Republican... He takes him out, like, you know, from his little bag, his little... Right. <laughs> every but that's week. a Republican Party, <laughs> yeah. right? That's, you know, these members yeah. of Congress, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. President Trump does not own the electorate, yeah. right? And what we see is that there's also Republicans, right, that mm. do not like President Trump. Yeah. And that they think that bipartisanship is good, that decency is good, yeah. that, you know, crafting deals right. in the most legislative, uh, yeah. uh, whatever. Artisan it, uh, yes. legislation. It's hand good. Carved. <laughs> so they might see these senators, yeah. right, as, okay, yeah, that's what we want. That's what we need. So and I think, I that, don't know. I think that's the offense Democrats are trying to play. is like, if we can basically convince people that we should have done this, but the Republicans stood in the way, then it makes it look like all they want to do is just engage in the theatrics of it. Right. And I'm not sure that's going to penetrate the electorate because like you said, this is really something where the Republicans have been very good at messaging. So I'm not sure that, you know, time will change that right. much, at least in terms of time until the election. The other complication here is this, and that is that the House has voted to impeach Alexander Mayorkas, who is the um, Homeland Security Secretary. This is 
is obviously uh, an ongoing kind of thing. We've talked about this before. The politics of impeachment, the weaponization of oh, impeachment yeah. is all wrapped up in this. But this has to complicate the ability to get things done on the border, right? Because again, it's really just about blame game, right? right? And the kind of use of grievances to try to get things done politically to prime your base. So this is definitely part of the reason that this bill failed. So ultimately, it's all just a kind of mess in Washington. But really, ultimately, I think Republicans win from this, no matter how you cut it. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely, because yeah. immigration is a, uh, we have seen it before, and it has been used many, 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 many times uh, in our history since the 1800s, right? Yeah. As a um, as a wedge issue that allows to rally the bases and also rallies the base on both sides. Yeah. Rallies the base on the Republican side because they says, well, we're being mm. invaded, so on and so forth, but also rallies the, the base on the Democratic side, on yeah. the more liberal side, because they say, well, you know, these people are just barbarians and, you know, they don't have any respect for human rights. Yeah. So it rallies them. So it tends to maintain the status quo for both Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. So it's an issue that plays nice on both sides yeah. republicans and democrats have had chances mm -hmm. in congress yes to fix immigration yeah that's true and, and like a decade ago they were very very close but yep none yes. has uh, uh none of the uh, both uh, political sides have have done it yeah. so i'm actually my one of my pet theories is that because politics is so visual now it's hard for the democrats to be able to kind of maneuver around this because if you show mm. pictures of the border and the kind of chaos it's there you, you can definitely see that people are affected by it and even if it's not true and even if the numbers say a different story the visuals are so impactful right. so i do think it's tough for them to reach some kind of agreement because the incentives really aren't there yeah but you have the business community right yeah and they really want to see some change. Right? Yeah, that, I yeah. mean, there is a shortage in terms mm. of, you know, so, uh, to fill up certain uh, positions. Yeah. And yeah. the business community wants, you know, uh, workers. Yeah. So the business community has to step up yeah. and say, if you don't fix this problem, no more money to your yeah. political campaigns. Yeah. You do whatever you want to do. We'll see. Well, That's a tough call. We'll see yeah, how that uh, plays out for them, right? But yeah, some force here is needed because otherwise oh yeah. nothing's going to get done. Yep. And that just goes to the kind of intractableness of this problem. So obviously the big news of the week is about the federal government versus Texas on a border security issue. This is Party Politics. I'm Brandon. This is Geronimo. We're going to talk all about how it is that Greg Abbott has gone to war against Joe Biden and the yeah. federal government. Uh, this is a tough battle for the state because obviously the federal government has got the purview to be able to make these choices. This has been an ongoing fight, but the most recent incarnation of this is that the Supreme Court of the U.S. held five to four that the Border Patrol agents can cut and move yep. wire to get migrants to continue to um, sort of pass through. Um, this has been a fight with Border Patrol. It's been a fight with Greg Abbott. But basically, again, the Supreme Court has sort of reaffirmed this idea that the federal government's responsible for border security. Now, Greg Abbott and Republicans like Dan Patrick, the lieutenant governor, are saying, well, they're not doing their job, so we're going to try to do the job for you. Right. But obviously, the kind of on-the-ground issue is problematic and has created this kind of real friction, right? Yeah. Now, Texas governors forever have been successful at saber rattling against the federal government, right? Going back to the 1950s, you know, through civil rights, uh, you know, all the way through immigration right. issues, um, even just land dispute issues, just a lot of different interactions, Republicans and Democrats as governors versus the federal government. But this seems to be taking it to a new level, rising this call for like, Texas secession, which is completely impractical, right. illegal, and would not end well militarily at all, despite the fact that we have a lot of Ford F-150s. So let me get your take on like why it is that this has become such a fixed battle right now. Is it just an election year thing? Is it Greg Abbott's looking for a kind of motion towards a national trend, a national kind of politics? Uh, what's going on? I think both. Both, right? yeah. And, and, you know, the fact of the matter is that it's a very interesting case for many, many, many reasons, right? The first one is obviously this would be a Supreme Court decision that yeah. it's, you know, done, right? Yeah. If you follow the basically, you know, based on 
many cases. Mm -hmm. uh, that go back to the 1940s. Yeah. Uh, recent cases in terms of you know Arizona versus United States versus Arizona back in 2012. You know, it's easy yeah. because the Supreme Court has this said you know this is this thing. It's fair policy. But on the other side, you have like Briscoe Cain, a rep here from Houston, saying, "Well, like the Supreme Court has made their decision, come enforce it." Like echoing Andrew Jackson. So how does this get resolved? Like, what's the outcome here? That's it. Well, like, I think that. You know, at the end, it's going to be the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, Governor Abbott in Texas is basing the, you know, the reticence of getting rid of the barbed wire, this or that, or the uh, uh, water barriers, mm. so on and so forth, based on Article 1 yeah. uh, uh, and Section 10 closely that, you know, Texas is invoking its constitutional authority to defend itself based right. on an invasion, right? right? But... <laughs> it's not an invasion, invasion, right? right? Yeah. I mean, it's not an invasion. Right. And the funny thing is that this question was asked, you know, in the 1800s to Madison. Interesting. Right? And Madison, as a founder, yeah. right, he said, well, you know, if friendly uh, uh, foreign nationals come here without, you know, bearing arms and that kind of stuff, that is not an invasion. It's not an invasion. No, yeah, the okay. Supreme Court has a rule on this in yeah. 1996, so on and so forth. So... We have the trend, right? Uh, let me just uh, explain it. Roe v. Wade, yeah, right? Yeah. It was the decision was this was not in the Constitution. The founding fathers never thought of this thing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, now we have this interpretation that it's an originalist interpretation. Yeah. James Madison yeah. answered the question like yeah. himself, yes, right? Yes. So we're going to see if the Supreme <laughs> Court now says, oh, yeah, but we're just originalists on the things that we don't like. Yeah. And on the other things, we're going to be like yeah. oh, a something little, else. A little more flexible. So yeah. it's a, for me, the real, real, real winner or loser is going to be the Supreme Court in terms of how yeah. they try to disentangle this thing. Because yeah. if they rule in favor of Texas, yeah. The Supreme Court is 1,000 percent yeah. a political, another political body. Yeah. Well, and it's true because, you know, we've seen like the like Dan Patrick push back on even Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, and saying, well, the you know Supreme Court has once again let us down. Right. So right. partisanizing the Supreme Court, oh, which, yeah. you know, of course, is inevitable given that they're weighing in on these political questions, but also really complicated and problematic from a rule of law point of view. So as you say, if Texas defies the Supreme Court, then all of a sudden you've got this array of the rule of law, which has all kinds of implications down the road. I think we're probably going to see cooler heads prevail. I don't think you're going to see a real honest to goodness sort of civil war on this. I don't think anybody wants to push it that far. Right. But, you know, Texas governors, like I've said, historically have had success politically by fighting the federal government with words, not so much <laughs> with uh, pitchforks and guns. But Yeah, but now it is the case, right? Yeah, and maybe so. But I think, honestly, it's not so much that, you, that Greg Abbott and company have to win on this. They just have to fight. And the fighting is what really excites the base. And so I think that's a big portion of this. In fact, if you look at polling on this, right, for 2024, the number one issue voters say is important is immigration and the border, 29 percent. The next is the economy and then health care and then abortion. So right. if you're a Republican running on the immigration issue and you can pivot a little bit to the economy, then you're going to win, right? Those are the issues they're fighting about. Those are the issues that they're going to win on. So that's a difficult narrative, again for the Democrats to change. But I have to say this, too, because, like we said, as a national story, this is something Texas is involved in. Donald Trump has yet to pick a VP, right? Um, it's possible that Greg Abbott may be in that spot, and not that anyone really runs for VP, right? Everybody says that, you know, I don't want to be anybody's VP, but right. that could be in the mix here. So I do think that being an, of a national profile, like the hashtag I stand with Greg Abbott was right. trending during the time that this fight was going on. So this is a real national story. And to me, again, evidence that Texas politics is now national politics. It's been right. for at least 20 years, but we're seeing it creep in in a way that is beneficial potentially for Republicans. So that's kind of how I think this plays out. The other thing, too, and I want to ask you about this, and that's the federalization of a National Guard. Now, by statute, presidents can do this. They right. rarely do, right? Um, for like the, you know, riots in the 90s yep. in L.A., um, the, you know, integration of Little Rock and the schools in 1957. Even in 1971, you saw uh, Nixon do this to dis spell protesters in D.C., but it's a really rare thing. And I think, honestly, that Joe Biden doesn't want to up the stakes on this any more than there already is, because right. like you said earlier, 
politically, this is something that's hard for them to win on. And the public is really not that excited about in a kind of aggressive use of unilateral presidential power. So I don't think he wants to go that far. He would like to kind of just pull back <laughs> right. on this, you know, yank the reins a little bit and let things settle down. But what do you think about the federalization question? Because Democrats are saying you have to do it now. Texas is openly defying the Supreme Court. It's time. Well, I mean, that's you know, the thing that I disagree with you that, you know, governors have the saber rattling and that kind of stuff and fighting words. This is not fighting words. I mean, this is the government say, like the Supreme Court said, yeah. these guys can cut the razor wires. Yeah. End of story. Yeah. I'm the Supreme Court. Yeah. Like, yeah. Supreme Court, <laughs> you have to, right? You have robes. <laughs> and, you know, in Texas, a, a lot of the of the state leadership said, like, yeah, whatever. They caught it. We're going to put it back. We'll put it back. What yeah. up? Yeah, yeah. What are you going to do about so it? The, yeah. Exactly. What yeah. are you going to do about it? So yeah. right now, it's, a, you know, kind of a game of chicken. Mm. So if the federal government, regardless of, you know, partisanship, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. if the federal government wants to continue the federal pact in terms of following the Constitution, because yeah. this is a federal law. Yeah. It's right. above. It's in the Constitution. Yeah, yeah. It's in the Constitution. James Madison said it. It's in the Constitution. <laughs> and he would know. <laughs> exactly. It's like... You right. have to do you it. You have to do this. And we'll see. Right. Because this is the case of saying, well, uh, you like the Constitution. You defend the Constitution. Yeah. Yeah, it's right it's here. It's right here. Yeah. It's, in, it's, it's hard to read. It's a little bit faded, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's still right here. There. So uh, that's going to be very interesting. Yeah. So my opinion is that if they want to do it, as you said, they have to do it, okay. and they have to do it now. Okay. And we'll see. We'll, we'll watch this because this is really going to be something what I think be an issue up until the election, maybe even day oh, right? yeah. where you see this as a motivator, like that October surprise is going to be something in this mix. So oh, absolutely. Mark my words, this absolutely. will not go away. And, and finally, just very quickly, and then I understand the position of the states, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, they're like we're spending all this money on this, exactly. right? And so we have to have something yeah. for it, right? No, it's uh, I agree that there's a better solution than oh, yeah. like this tweet war about you know yeah. how we're going to cut the wire if you put it back. That's not the best solution no, here. No, it is not. Uh, but let's talk about a different style of the rule of all law. Right. And obviously, uh, let's just switch to Texas, and that's the thing that we do best. Uh, this is party politics. I'm Brandon. This is Geronimo. We are talking now about Texas and okay. about the all Republicans. Republican Supreme Court that has temporarily blocked the deposition of Attorney General Ken Paxton in the whistleblower case that basically spurred his right. impeachment. There's a lot going on here. Let me just give you a quick summary. Basically, what the Supreme Court said is that both parties had until February 27th or 29th, rather, to respond to the bigger legal arguments at stake here. Um, basically, this is a legal case that the whistleblower was brought against Ken Paxton. Ken Paxton said he wasn't going to fight anymore, that anything that they said was going to be accepted. And so basically, as a matter of fact, literal fact, that whatever the whistleblower said was true is true. But the jur a judge in Travis County said, no, you have to be deposed. So this is working its way up to the Texas Supreme Court, where the Texas Supreme Court said that we're going to pause on this until we can make some hearings. Now, in the meantime, obviously, this has become very, very mm -hmm. political. You had none other than Donald J. Trump weigh in on this and say that the Texas Supreme Court should basically, you know, end this. Right, no testimony from Governor from Attorney General uh, Ken Paxton. So, not surprisingly, this is part of the political story. Right. In addition to that, you had this week former Senator uh, Drew Springer say that he thinks that maybe there should be a do-over on impeachment. That maybe it was the case that Ken Paxton misled the Senate yep. and made a mockery of the proceedings. That's unlikely to happen right. in, for any number of reasons. Right. There's no legal logistical mechanism to make this happen. And also the politics of this, I think, have moved beyond this. And now they're willing to kind of fight it out in primaries, which right. is what we're seeing happen. So, like, what do you think about the way that this has unfolded? And do you think that there's any chance that Ken Paxson's going to be deposed <laughs> on the whistleblower case? I mean, I don't know yeah. if he's going to be deposed or not, but he's just, you know, he's... Uh... Once he said that he's not going to con contest any of yeah. the saints of the whistleblowers, you know, it's, it's not admitting guilt, mm. but also is not saying that you're guilty or anything like that. Right. It's like wishy-washy, yeah. right? Yeah, because Paxson says basically, um, you know, the impeachment process more or less exonerated me. Right. And so I'm just going to kind of admit to all these things. Right. But Springer, Senator Springer says... 
like if you're admitting to this, you're admitting to, to guilt, right? Exactly. Effectively, and right. the state's going to have to pay, which means the ledge is going to have to ultimately, after all the impeachment stuff, right. <laughs> after objecting to the money that they were going to have to pay, was going to have to pay anyway. Right. So, so uh, the question here is like, if you are deposed, you're on their oath. Mm-hmm. Don't lie. Yeah. <laughs> Don't lie to a judge. <laughs> and, right? Yes. If you are on their oath, yeah. you don't want to be deposed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying, I, I don't know. I can see why they want to fight it because right. that opens up liability issues. But I actually think that, you know, it gives up the political side of things a boost, right? That they want to play the martyr. Ken Paxson wants to be the person who's seen as being aggrieved here, right? He's right. the one who's being attacked. So politically, it may actually benefit him. The fighting, I think, again, is just about sort of making sure the base is happy. But as a legal matter, I think you're exactly right. There's real liability here that oh, he would yeah. very much like to avoid. Oh, yeah. But no matter how you slice it, the state's going to have to pay, right? I mean, they're going to have to kick in this money because the whistleblowers have got a case and effectively the attorney general is more or less admitting this is all true. So yep. exactly how it happens and when it happens, we don't know. But that money is going to come out of the state's coffers yep. <laughs> unless they can figure out some other kind of deal. But what's interesting to me is the politics of this because, you know, Ken Paxson obviously has made this an issue in primaries, but there hasn't been a lot of money put into it. Now, Greg Abbott and the kind of school voucher folks have put a bunch of money into primaries. We're seeing ads ramp up, digital, TV, radio, but Ken Paxton's allies haven't really ponied up a lot of money for this. Now, he's got about $2 million on hand, but a lot of that he's spent on his own legal bills. The kind of big pack, the Defend Texas Liberty pack, is now basically defunct. Yeah. They've rebranded to um, now they're called the Texans United for a Conservative Majority again inside this kind of ongoing churn of a yep. battle in the GOP. So there aren't a lot of defenders for Ken Paxton left. Um, do you think this is going to be an issue in primaries where Ken Paxton can basically move the needle and say, this person supported me, so let's go with them. This person didn't support me, so they need to go. I mean, because there is a like a, a crossover of of things because you have the pro vouchers, anti vouchers, yeah. pro Paxton, anti Paxton, right? So you have a matrix. It's this Venn diagram. Exactly. Of, of, so of. <laughs> some of them uh, right. are you know pro vouchers, yeah. pro Paxton, right. so they're endorsed by both the governor and the attorney general. Yeah. In some cases, that's not the case. Yeah. But as you said, Paxton doesn't have the money that Abbott has yeah. in order to support these things. Right. So it's yeah. Uh, we'll Unknown. see. Um, I'm not convinced that it's going to be that much of a sway, but you never know, right? We're looking at probably very low primary turnout, right. so that could make the difference. Another issue that came up this week in terms of primaries is that Donald Trump once again has injected himself into Texas politics. Yep. And he has endorsed David Covey, who's one of the opponents of Speaker Dade Phelan in his Beaumont district. The president uh, criticized Dade Phelan for supporting the impeachment of his ally, none other than Attorney General Ken Paxton, which the former president called fraudulent. Um, I think that you're right, that Paxton can't move the needle on a lot of these because the money's not there. And right. I think that people don't trust him or like him as much as they like Abbott. But I do think that Phelan should be nervous here. He's got three opponents. Sure. The recipe for getting a loss in this is that you basically split the vote three ways, get into a runoff, and then the runoff is where they pick you off right. because you have even lower turnout then. So I think that's interesting. The other thing interesting is that speakers are now the targets, right? We saw it with, you know, uh, in D.C., right, with right. Kevin McCarthy. We've seen it with Joe Strauss here, and now we're seeing it, uh, you know, with um, with Speaker Phelan. So there's a good chance this could be a real problem for him. I mean, sure. Uh, the record so far mm. of, you know, targeting incumbents yeah. uh, is not great. From Trump, yeah. Uh, from Trump yeah. Is, 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 is Meeks at best. Okay, yeah. He's more Barry Bonds than like Cal Ripken. Is exactly. that what you're saying? Like, exactly. And <laughs> Donnie think, Average not so right. good. Now, he can hit for power, though, and that's the thing. Sure. Because in a race like this, it's really high profile. This might be one of those times where it's like people are really out to get for you. Sure, but, you know, the way that they're being targeted, right, mm. is, as you say, you know, Paxton is not like super... Yeah. loved among all Republican voters, yeah. right? I think there's a divide. Mm -hmm. So it can go both ways, mm -hmm. uh, one thing. The other thing is that, you know, if they're being targeted in this case, for example, for the Pax of impeachment or support of vouchers or whatnot, you know, Republicans that were opposing vouchers, right, mm -hmm. were representing the views of their constituents. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's someone comes and says, well, they're right. not doing good. It's yeah. like, 
Mm, the voters are like, I disagree mm, because yeah. they're doing good to me. And to that point, actually, another thing that happened this week was that in House District 2, which is a special election you to go. pick the replacement for Representative Brian Slayton, who was expelled from the House right. uh, following an investigation that he had engaged in inappropriate sexual conduct with an aide. Um, Jill Dutton, who was the kind of stalwart for yeah. the more establishment wing, yeah. the Associate Republicans of Texas and Dade Feeling, beat Brett Money, who was backed by people like Ken Paxton, um, a lot of the money from yep. West Texas, the sort of very conservative billionaires, um, the Defend Texas Liberty, which doesn't exist anymore. She wins by a very small amount, uh, but it's an indication perhaps that even in a very low turnout election that you're seeing the establishment not just kind of cowering and, and really you know winning in a close and pretty, right. pretty important election. Right. So we're going to see, and, and the lesson of the day is that the Republican Party is fragmented yeah. and that there's a lot of things in the air. Yeah. You saw the vice chair in the GOP exactly. statewide running for chair against yeah. Matt Rinaldi. That, too, is another kind of one of these features that shows this divide. The party itself isn't raising a lot of money. They've become somewhat irrelevant. So this fight about who this conservative core group is associated with, right, the kind of Nick Fuentes yep. camp, the people who were in sort of associated with this very far right, almost, you know, Nazi is in some cases, uh, is, I think, not appealing to mainstream Republicans. The question is, are they going to come out to vote? And that we don't really know. I think we're still going to see pretty low turnout. Polling suggests Donald Trump's going to run away with the primary here in Texas. So I don't know if people are even going to show up. So if the turnout's 7%, 10% in the, the right. horror side of things, then I think you're probably in a position where that's just the most committed people, which could be a problem for like some of the more moderates who want to see bigger turnout. Yeah, we'll see. But that's a question that we're going to continue answering or at least attempting to answer uh, in the next couple of weeks. I'm Canonimo Cortina. And I'm Brandon Roddinghouse. The conversation keeps up next week.